into our midst, that we might hear your word and demonstrate your grace. Amen. September is National Suicide Prevention Month, where we're encouraged to raise awareness of suicide prevention. In the passage from Mark, a woman tells Jesus that her daughter is suffering from demon possession. In today's terms, the child was suffering from some form of mental illness, which continues to be misunderstood by many. Countless members of Inland Hills, a mega church in California, was stunned by the news of their beloved pastor's suicide on August 25th, leaving behind a wife and three young boys. Even though I did not know Andrew Stockland, I too was affected by his death because of the effect mental illness has on friends, parishioners, colleagues, family members, and myself. It's a stark reminder that mental illness has the capacity to destroy lives, not only the life of the individual, but the lives of the people he or she loves. I was in my first year of seminary when I went to my doctor because of severe allergies, and as we talked, she casually asked how things were going. Unexpectedly, the tears began to fall, and I said, I don't know where those came from. After asking me a series of questions, she diagnosed me with clinical depression. I'm fortunate that my doctor identified the symptoms and I was able to receive the support and proper treatment I needed. In hindsight, I realized that I've suffered with depression my entire life. It was only through my own experience with depression that I also concluded that my dad suffered from depression, though he was never diagnosed or treated. Depression in my family doesn't end there. One of my grandchildren was diagnosed at the age of nine. It's heartbreaking to see someone you love deeply, especially a child, suffer with mental illness. Knowing depression can potentially lead to suicide, I often worry about my grandchild's life, much like the Seraphonician woman who feared for her daughter's life. When Jesus was sending the disciples to do ministry, he instructed them not to travel to Gentile cities, stating that he was only sent for the people of Israel. So it's uncertain why they were headed directly to the Gentile region of Tyre. As they walked along, a woman who had heard that Jesus had arrived approached him, bowing down at his feet begging him to heal her daughter. This was a Gentile, a woman, a pagan, an idol worshiper, who brazenly approached a Jewish man in public. I can imagine her neighbors peeking out their windows, shocked and embarrassed by her appalling behavior. The way Jesus responded is just as surprising as the woman's behavior. I don't particularly like the Jesus that's portrayed in this story. He's rude, condescending, inconsiderate, exclusive, and insulting by calling her a dog. I think his father would have been ashamed. She's just a desperate mama, willing to break all traditions and barriers in order for her ill daughter to receive the help she needs. The disciples failed to understand the magnitude of this woman's anguish, just like those who didn't understand the anguish experienced by Pastor Andrew or anyone else with depression or anxiety. After his death, Stockland's wife wrote, you were right all along. I truly didn't understand the depths of your depression and anxiety. I didn't understand how real and how relentless the spiritual attacks were. The pain, 
the fear and the turmoil you must have been dealing with every single day is unimaginable. Some have difficulty understanding how a person who seems to have everything could take his or her own life. Sometimes the deceased is wrongly accused of being selfish or cowardly. People wonder how life could be so horrible that someone would choose to commit suicide. I would argue that suicide is more an act of desperation, hopelessness, isolation, and loneliness rather than a choice one makes because at the time they are incapable of making logical or rational decisions. Their mental capacity to choose, severely limited by his or her illness. Many people don't comprehend how debilitating this illness can be. It is not a weakness or a flaw in one's character. You can't just get over it or pull yourself up it isn't the same as sadness or feeling down. It's a real illness. A brain disorder that can change or distort the way you see yourself, your life, and those around you. It's a disorder that lasts for weeks, months, or even years, and interferes with daily living. Oftentimes, people with depression see everything in a negative way. It's difficult for them to imagine that a problem or situation can be solved in a positive way. While at a seminar hosted by a nonprofit counseling center, a colleague asked, how can we as pastors identify people who are suffering from depression and help them get the assistance they need? The answer was, you have to recognize the symptoms and ask questions, because some people are great at masking their feelings. They function well in public while they suffer in silence. Research shows people who are having thoughts of suicide feel relief when someone asks after them in a caring way. Findings suggest acknowledging and talking about suicide may reduce rather than increase suicidal ideation. Here are some facts and statistics. Although major depression can strike people at any age, the median age at onset is 32 and a half. Depression is more common in women than in men. Although women are hit harder by depression and are more vulnerable to it because of their biology, the illness is missed more frequently in men because symptoms are harder for other people to recognize. Men with depression are more likely than women with the illness to commit suicide. Symptoms of depression extend beyond feeling sad. They can include agitation, restlessness, irritability, and anger becoming withdrawn or isolated, insomnia or excessive sleeping, chronic fatigue and lack of energy, feeling hopeless, helpless, worthless, or guilty, loss of interest or pleasure in activities that were once enjoyed, sudden change in appetite often accompanied with weight gain or loss, difficulty concentrating, thoughts of death or suicide. Mental illness and suicide are not limited to adults. Suicide is the third leading cause of death for youth between the ages of 10 and 24 and results in approximately 4,600 lives lost every year. Deaths from su youth suicide are only part of the problem. More young people survive suicide attempts than actually die. A nationwide survey of high school students in the United States found that 16% of students reported seriously considering suicide. 
13% reported creating a plan, and 8% reported trying to take their own life in the 12 months preceding the survey. Each year, approximately 157,000 youth between the ages of 10 and 24 are treated in emergency departments across the U.S. for self-inflicted injuries. There are well-meaning people who claim that if the person with depression only had more faith, he or she would be healed. I think that's a ridiculous assertion and, and a burden that God would not place upon anyone. We know that not everyone is healed from their illnesses, and it isn't because of a lack of faith. Science has shown that mental illness, brain disorders, are not curable. One physician said, no blessing or success can cure a disease of the brain. Mental illness is sometimes treatable with therapy or medication, or a combination of the two, but sadly, there are some people who are unresponsive to either treatment. In times of tragedy, we ask questions that are common to all of humanity. Why would God allow this kind of suffering? Why are some people healed while others are not? Sometimes people offer platitudes as a means of helping but instead they can be extremely harmful and hurtful. I think a more appropriate and truthful response to those questions are, I don't know. I don't believe that suicide is God's will or God's plan for anyone. God's ultimate will for each of us is to live abundant, joy-filled lives Though we are painfully aware that that doesn't always happen. But God always hears our cries of heartache, pain, and misery. Just as God grieved deeply as Jesus died on the cross, God also mourns the devastating agony suffered by those with mental illnesses and other illnesses. I'm confident that in those last moments of Pastor Stockland's life, I'm sure he was surrounded by God's love. As he breathed his last breath, God promised for him, God's promise for him was fulfilled. God wiping the tears from his eyes and welcoming him into a life where there is no mourning, no more crying, and no more pain. Friends, I urge you to become familiar with the signs of mental illness and depression and anxiety, and always take the threat of suicide seriously. Call a doctor, hospital, or counseling center so the individual can receive the help they so desperately need. It is easy to be overwhelmed by the pain of the world. We want to turn off the evening news and tune out the stories of human suffering. But God calls us to pay attention to those around us, to do more than pray the situation into God's hands. Our faith is to be lived out in righteous actions that we might resist wickedness and avoid condemnation for our lack of compassion. We are challenged to meet the needs of others, to reach out with hand and heart, to provide for the real needs of others. 